Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Do we need to advertise during the pandemic? Please note that this session will be recorded and you will be able to access the recording via the acuityads.com website. Allow me to quickly introduce today's speaker, Suraj Barwani. He is the Chief Strategy Officer of Acuity Ads a decision science technology platform for performance advertising through digital channels. Suraj has been through at least two major recessions in his 25 year history as a digital advertising specialist, including the dot-com burst and the great recession of 2008. He is therefore an amazing person to be advising us today and we look forward to his thoughts and leadership. Without further ado, I will pass you to Suraj. Welcome to the session this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> that was my way of introducing where we are today. Uh, we are all shocked and surprised with where we have ended up in just two or three weeks here in North America. And so we have the benefit of a large number of inquiries that we have received over the past few weeks from a variety of clients, uh, friends, colleagues who really are wondering all in marketing and advertising and media uh, as to how should we be thinking about marketing? Here that the world has sort of turned upside down for all of us. And so we have a very broad audience today in front of us. Um, we have people from senior marketing, large mega brands and small and DTC brands. We have people from agencies. We have people from the media and the publishing and the media sales organizations. So it's a very broad audience. We wanted to make sure that we provide a pretty broad coverage of exactly how one should be thinking about uh, what the circumstances are. Data is a little sparse. As you can imagine, all of this has happened so fast that the research organizations have not been able to really stay with it. But we wanted this conversation to be very data and insights driven. So with, with that, you will notice that our team here, our head of marketing, Joanna, Jackson, Jay, the whole team has actually put a lot of effort into looking at a wide variety of data sources so we can make it as facts driven as we can. So you check this out. Our goal is obviously a conversation starter. So hopefully you can walk away with a few key insights that will help you make more informed decisions going forward. Let's start with where life is at this point. This is where we are. Our behaviors are beginning to change significantly. Um, just to lighten things up just a little bit in the way life is at this point, this is the kind of stuff that we worry about these days. Um, and here we are. This is how we get the work done. Um, and all the ways in which what we used to think we could do and accomplish and, and uh, build camaraderie and so forth no longer is available to us. There is a whole new world emerging at this point in terms of how. We live, work, take care of ourselves, and do everything else now from our own homes. It's just an amazing world. If, uh, if you are like me, you know there are days when it feels like everything is falling apart, and then there are days we keep reminding ourselves, it's okay, we can get through the day, and we'll emerge very strong. So. Let me tell you what has really been happening here. There is a chain reaction of activities that we are beginning to see here. So starting with the shock of the virus, which you have heard a lot about, it's not like we need to belabor that point. That resulted in a supply shock, which was disruption from countries like China and so forth, which has essentially impacted the availability of products and many other things that countries have been depending on, North America in particular, has outsourced so much of the production capacity elsewhere. With that came also the demand shock now, which is lockdowns and business shutdowns and all of that, which has 
put us in a very, very difficult spot. And so the government is beginning to respond in a significant way. And so now we have the policy shock. All of this aggregated together is what has culminated into literally today, we are looking at an unprecedented government stimulus, over $2 trillion of a variety of activities from fighting the, the epidemic, the money to the consumers they badly need to get through the weeks upcoming here, the healthcare institutions, they need the support system to really take care and provide the services, and then the businesses, big enterprises, small businesses, all of these. Think of it this way. There's going to be an amazing amount of money slushing through the system here over the next few months. And if we can be all thoughtful and smart about how we approach uh, the weeks and the months uh, ahead of us, you can come out very strong. And I think that's really how I want to approach this discussion, which is you can come to this session thinking, you know, the glass is half empty, or you can come in thinking glass is half full. I'm trying to give you the most balanced perspective I can, given everything that I see, so that you can move forward in a very thoughtful and a smart way. Okay, so you have three choices. You can assume business is as usual. You can panic and say, we're going to cut all marketing, stop everything. Nobody's going to buy anything right now. That's another possibility. Or you can be very thoughtful and strategic about how you can devise an alternative plan. Okay, well, if, if you've joined this session, we pretty much assume you are in that camp of people who want to be thoughtful and want to be planning. So what do you plan? What kind of a planning horizon you should have in mind? Well, let's go there. So we don't know exactly how long this whole activity could be simply because we are just hitting into the eye of the corona. But what you can do is depend on some of the data we have available from those who've actually seen the early wave of the virus in China and Korea. And you can see what has happened. Drastic lockdowns, very scale testing that Korea built, tracking and so forth. And we have the statistics and the benefit of some of the institutions that have been tracking. So let's start there, just get an idea of where this is so we can establish a planning horizon. So here we are by any combination of estimates you can see that ultimately roughly anywhere from three quarters to a percentage of the total population could actually be affected by it, which is somewhere in the three to four million people, which is pretty sizable. And it's gonna come this way. We're gonna have a scalable testing the way we are beginning to see the capacity build up right there sometime in, 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 in April. And there is no treatment or vaccine that is supposed to be available anytime until 2021. So essentially, once the testing begins, you're going to see a big spike. And with that follow on, there's going to be all this, you know, both monetary and fiscal stimulus. Taxes delayed, amazing amount of money floating through, business loans, checks, all of this. You can see how this scenario is going to play out, right? If you are thinking that this situation is going to be over in four weeks or six weeks, frankly, that's too much to expect. We should be planning for the next six to nine months. That should be our planning horizon. Okay. All right. So with that, let's look at three things. One, how is the consumer behavior impacted? What's its impact on media? And then what can you as a marketer and advertiser really do? What specific actions? I'm going to get from the very high level to as specific as we can get in terms of actions you can take. All right. You don't need data for me to prove to you that walk-in traffic has literally come to a standstill. You cannot count on, on physical store visits at this point, yes? People are still going to pharmacies. They are potentially going to grocery stores. Uh, they stocked up a lot here in recently, but just about every age cohort is beginning to avoid anything to do physical, from public transportation to malls, to movie theaters, to restaurants, all of it. 
it's all coming to a standstill. So what is it that people are doing? Well, a major shift is happening. Now, if you look at the data, you will notice every data point is, is sourced right at the bottom with a sample size. Most samples are reasonably large and, and statistically reliable, which is the right reason we've actually relied on these sources. So if you compare those, you know, before the onset of the virus and then post, you begin to see a major shift in the viewing of online news, TV and streaming, social, radio, music, and also movement towards buying online. None of this should be a surprise if you just watch your own behavior. It's pretty reasonable to see that, right? Millennials and Gen X is where the vast majority of the shift has actually taken place. Although boomers are also not that far behind, I think it's gradually building up. All right, so if people are buying, look at the behavior here in terms of e-commerce activity. Buying behavior is really, really shifting to digital, as you can see. As I said before, the eye of the virus and the epicenter is moving towards North America. So if you look at China and Italy as sort of the early harbingers of what really happens, you can see massive shift towards e-commerce, right? And you are beginning to see that happen in, in US and Canada. There is going to be consequences which I'm going to cover here relatively soon. I just want us all to be grounded on the same assumptions. So when you ask consumers, what are they buying more and what are they spending less? <laughs> you could see what is happening here. Look at the products where there is amazing amount of growth here in the last few weeks from streaming entertainment, baby pet supplies, you know, the food and personal care. These are all the things that are basic essentials, necessities without which a household cannot really run. And so again, no surprises here. On the other hand, where people are looking at spending less, we are looking at high spending considered purchases for the most part, right? things that fit into the overall disposable spending, which people may think as like, oh, I don't necessarily need it right away and therefore I can wait. And that's essentially uh, sort of what we are beginning to see. On the consumables essential side is just going crazy. Look at that, look at toilet paper, right? Um, hand sanitizers. A lot of these are the absolute basics that people uh, need to have, and therefore you are beginning to see people stockpiling on these things, right? Um, okay, so here's the first clear indication of the opportunities which many brands look for for years. If you were actually waiting for a monumental event to strike, well, that event has arrived for you. When things are in short supply, especially within the essentials and so forth, there are challenger brands out there, there are direct to consumer brands that have actually been building up capacity over time and trying to reach out and so forth. This is an amazing time to actually reach out to consumers and encourage them to try because they are more open to trying because the supplies are in shortage and therefore they are willing to try new and different propositions and new brands and so forth. So the timing is great. There are many other life stage brands, which are more financial security, home security, uh, potentially even life insurance, all of those things, you know, people consider it when something significant of the crisis happens and then all of a sudden they are reminded, oh my God, I didn't do it. I wish I had, well, maybe now is the time I should take care. And so, it's a reconsideration that forces it because of the crisis, the way we face, right? Again, there is one other topic that I'm gonna repeatedly remind you of that almost everything should be done tastefully in context with sensitivity. This is not about crazy salesmanship and marketing, right? This is really about being considered, being very thoughtful, as I said, from the very beginning. Okay, so let's look at further deep into the media consumption, right? Where's the consumer attention shifting? Well, this is a good study. This is Nielsen's study, frankly, very recently, which they studied in a variety of countries. So if you look at the baseline, 
This is called TV consumption, which includes streaming and digital video. Just as a baseline, if you look at people who work in offices, just classic work week, Monday through Friday, and if they move and you compare their behavior when they're working remotely from home, you actually see uh, TV-like video consumption go up about 14%. Nothing to do with COVID, nothing to do with the epidemic or nothing, it's just basic. You move people from office to go home and work from home. This is what happens, a 14% movement upward. Now look at the pre-COVID versus early COVID onset in the last couple of weeks. Same, Monday to Friday comparison, look at that. It goes up by 30%, literally double, right? Now, as we are entering the epicenter, that wave is coming us and we can only compare that with where it has already happened. If you look at China, Korea, and Italy, pre versus peak COVID, look at the number. It's gone up significantly in terms of consumption of streaming, TV, digital video, all of that. Look at the first time Netflix app stall in Italy and, and, and Spain, same thing, significant. There is a reason why the Netflix stock has not really taken a downward shift, even with all of the turmoil in the financial markets. It's because people are going after it, downloading, using it, right? But here's the big shift that has happened in regular linear television programming. The broad reach programming has literally evaporated, gone. None of the sports events are happening. The Olympics announced yesterday, that's postponed for a year, which means all of the good stuff that people used to spend the time with appointment programming just isn't there anymore. So that is going to have some serious consequences, which is coming up relatively shortly. So where are people really spending more of the time? Well, they're going into the streaming entertainment. Twitch, one of the major beneficiaries of all the gaming stuff that's actually happening. Look at year over year increases, right? or even NASCAR in iRacing now. That's also beginning to pick up. Uh, this is just, just came up here in the last few days. So what's going to happen? There are lots of people on this session right now, they're wondering, representing different types of media and publishers and so forth, what's gonna happen to my media? Where is it gonna go? Where the money's gonna shift? Well, this is our early indication of what we anticipate could happen, all right? So we've bucketed this into three pieces, soft, steady, and strong. Out of home, because of all the lockdowns, it's gonna be soft. Linear TV that I just said, life sports being paused is going to be under pressure. Inventory will just simply not be there, the kinds of things that advertiser used to depend on. Radio, even though consumption of radio is gonna go up, it'll be soft because you have literally universal retail shutdowns. So that part of the, of the spend is just disappeared. Sponsorships, with sports gone, there's not much there to do. And then all the production is getting stalled, which is all the branded content and stuff that publishers used to create, well, all the social distancing is essentially literally stalled all the production capacity. So there are problems over there. Search social and programmatic display mobile, we pretty much believe it's gonna remain where they are. They might you know, sense some pressure because overall advertising may be in a downshift shift a little bit, maybe go down by about 10, 15%. So they might face that, but from a, from a normal consumption standpoint, it will remain steady. Most of the attention is shifting towards streaming, in particular, advertiser-supported video on demand. CTV, what we call it, um, or programmatic digital video. Esports is gaining some serious ground and video games too. So you can see there will be some shift of budgets and we just need to be prepared for that in terms of how all of this is going to beginning to shape up. Okay. So that's all of that on the behavior side. Now I wanna get over to the marketing implications of all of that behavior. All right, so this is a tale of two demands. Just keep that in mind. 
the first thing you need to establish is what needs are you really serving? And therefore, how is that going to impact you one way or the other? There is an issue for literally every advertiser, whether you are on the left side of the house or the right side. We call it demand spike or demand slide. Now, the spike is you can see all the categories where I was showing you, there was all this stockpiling going on, people beginning to bring all of this stuff. So you can see that's happening, but there are some issues there in terms of supply shock there too. So it's not an easy ground there either. Consumer lending and small business lending is going to pick up significantly because businesses and consumers are looking to get through the next few weeks, next few months, and therefore they will need cash. Uh, people are all beginning to work from home. You know, kids are doing schooling remote uh, from home and therefore computers, telecom services are needed and everybody needs to stay busy with the, with, the, with the children in home. So the toys and all of that, games is beginning to pick up. So all of that is pretty natural. On the right side, again, you know, no surprises. I mean, literally, we've brought the economy to a standstill. Nobody's traveling. Uh, uh, tourism is 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 in in severe sort of uh, you know slump right now. Hospitality is facing difficulty, and all the local establishment where we normally go out and really have fun, well, those things simply aren't available. And therefore, this is sort of the bifurcation that essentially has happened now in the marketplace. So. I'm going to pursue these two tracks separately so you get the idea. Depending on which side of the house you are, we're going to address that part of the, of the economy for you. Let's assume that you are one of those advertisers or agencies who is on the, the demand spike side of the house. Well, what you really need to think about is how are you now going to power up your digital acquisition capabilities in a very smart, calculated way? First of all, as I said, your messaging is going to have to be a little bit more relevant to the current context. People are not just going to buy the same things the same way. Your product needs to go beyond where it has been. Why? Because we are now in a distance, in an isolated environment now. And so your product needs to cater to where I am now, where the consumers are right now, right? So that's important. Digital and e-commerce is the required option at this point. And when people buy online through e-commerce, you know, one of the biggest deals in shopping online is free shipping. If you can provide it, it reduces the barrier in a significant way. At the very minimum, if you are really, really dependent on retail distribution, then you need to offer what is called BOPAS. Walmart is known for that, which is you buy online and you pick up at the store. And you need to manage consumer expectations. You saw all those shelves clearing up. It is a major supply distribution issue. And if you have everything available, even if you have it online and if you expect disruptions, you're going to have to manage that. So, okay, let's go beyond the theory and show you some real examples of what's going on and what you can do. All right. Okay. As always, Nike's up there in the front line out there trying to inspire you to just do it. So they're saying, fine, if you want to go play out there in front of millions, play inside, go do it with some amazing commitment they are putting behind the response efforts uh, for this is called being relevant in context. You can do it, right? Okay. Next thing, others in the fitness and the apparel category are doing something similar, recognizing that we can't go to the gym and we can't do all the things we normally used to do to work out and do all those things. They are offering some nice courseware and programming. They are providing nice videos, how you can really sweat it out, do your thing, you know, work at home. All of that stuff is highly valuable. They're not just schlepping product in your face. They're telling you how you can really make it more part of your new way of living. That's what I mean by go beyond the product. The next thing is look at some of these brands and what they're doing. It's fantastic. Um, Urino Zinc is really 
a, a, an OTC personal care, it's a supplement. It's a mineral supplement that goes with men with their aging, you know, they begin to feel issues of frequent urination and other issues that they have with their prostate and so forth. These guys have come up with something really, really interesting. Look at what they're doing. They literally, they realize that it's hard to get a doctor's appointment these days. Clinics are shutting down. My, all of my dental appointments are gone and finished. I can't have any appointments. And so if somebody is feeling some of these sensations or some of these symptoms or what have you, what did they do? They put in these 20 videos out there, two to three minutes long, with a professional doctor specialist in, uh, <clears throat> in, in prosthetic care. These are questions that you can get answered right there. Whether you buy the product or not is not even instrumental here. This is about their being helpful to you where you are right now. Here's another brand, TitoCare. What is it doing? Well, these guys have come up with these devices. They ship you at home. And literally, if your kid has some allergies or strong fever or flu-like symptoms or whatever it is, you can get it diagnosed right there, capture the data with their device, and you see that physician who is available to you within five minutes on a video conference to actually help you diagnose through and recommend what you should be doing without having to rush over to the emergency room where as you know health capacity is severely constrained you're going to sit there for hours and hours and hours this is called helping in virtual environment where you are it's being helpful and this is all in the space of virtual medicine, virtual healthcare. One of our clients, Genomind, literally this week launched telepsychiatry. Literally, you can get the test done with something shipped to you within 48 hours, and boom, you're going to get a psychiatrist's advice online right away. Amazing amount of innovation is actually happening because of this crisis right now. It's amazing. Okay, now. Besides the tale of two demands that I was talking about, you also have a significant difference between whether your product is a small ticket item or a big ticket. What I mean by that, are we talking about $20, $30 product or somewhere in there, or are you talking about several hundred to several thousand dollar product? That's going to make a big difference, right? Are you surprised with that? In times of crisis, when you are expecting recessionary financial situation, people's purse strings get really tight. They need to think twice, three times whether this is something they absolutely need and should be spending the money. So this is two different things we are thinking about here. If you happen to be in the everyday essentials and consumables, there are a few things you should be thinking about. One, your advertising can get away with mid to low funnel communications. We'll get more specific about that and how you do that. Your distribution, many brands have the inclination and they've had this for the last easily two to three years, that perhaps if this is all about e-commerce, we should all be jamming straight into Amazon or Alibaba or, or, or Mercado Libre or something like that, right? We just put our product over there and boom, we can really take advantage of all this excitement around where people want to buy. The problem is that's not enough for you. Sooner or later, every brand has recognized that that's a very competitive environment. There could be tens, if not hundreds of resellers who will be competing with you on prices. There will be other competitors all of there. So it's not an easy environment and you're never going to get any real data. So you can't build any relationships or a franchise over the long term. You need to think through whether you're going to get the fulfillment done to Amazon or the alternatives. Your packaging needs to provide a lot of nice options, price flexibility, the ability to qualify for free shipping. Those are all the things that encourage people and make it easy for them to buy from you directly online because that's where they are now, right? Now, your returns policy also needs to be explicitly laid out. As you know, Costco is not expecting any returns. Now, we are sort of in this virus-infested environment where everybody is sensitive. So obviously, returns can't be feasible and you need to manage expectations and availability. All of this thing is going to become critical. I wanna show you a great example of a client we have who's doing some beautiful things. This is a category which is so near and dear to me because when I was going through my kids' amazing allergies they faced 
these guys have created products that are completely allergy free. They have a production and distribution facilities that are fully certified to really make it free of uh, nuts or, or gluten free or variety of allergens, you know, that actually come in the way. It's a fascinating thing that they are doing. And uh, you can just see uh, all the ways in which they have introduced it. They have these trial packs, which can allow you to qualify for the free shipping that goes with it. This is their direct to consumer uh, offering. If you uh, just look at the kind and the selections they actually provide, they also have an Amazon presence. It's, it's truly amazing the way they actually laid it out. So they're taking advantage of direct relationship, but also the Amazon presence. And guess what? These guys are supply constrained. They have demand shooting through the roof at this point because of all the things they've put in place. It's fascinating, right? And yet, because of that, they are also managing customer expectations. They're notifying customers that, look, we are running behind, you know, our supply systems are under constraint and therefore they are being upfront about it, not hiding from it, just telling them as it is. Now, if you are one of those brands that actually jumped straight into the marketplace, there are many brands who actually did it at some point. At the very minimum, you are going to have to have a DTC presence. Why? because of all the reasons I gave you, you need to build a direct relationship with consumer data to really build a franchise. Eventually you need the insights and you need the data to be able to serve the consumers. Remember, if you were going through retail distribution in the past, you never got any insights or data from your distribution partner. This is your opportunity to get it, even if you are selling through Amazon so that you can in fact have that level of control and be able to measure what impact collectively your entire system. So there's a whole ecosystem you want to be able to build. It's not just one or the other, the way I showed you in the case of ELF, which is part of Mondelez. Okay, now let's go to big ticket. If it's truly a considered purchase, there is no way out without doing a full funnel execution. The reminders are an integral part of a sales conversion mechanism here. You have to do that because people need to be reminded. If, if they're gonna build a deck for $10,000 or $20,000 or they're gonna buy a mattress for 3,000 bucks or whatever it is, they're gonna have to think through that at this point. A lot of advertising besides that for the big ticket items like a car, automobile, things like that, advertisers have actually always had to provide channel support. So don't forget about that. Dealers and your partners have to be encouraged and you need to be able to ensure that the shelf space is still there when you emerge out of this whole environment in the next three to six months, right? Otherwise, distributors are going to say, wow, we got no support and therefore this is out. I'm bringing another competitor in place. So you need to have that defensive mechanism in place, right? Your distribution, you need to have captive full service e-commerce. As I said, at the very minimum, have the ability to do your build online and pick it up later on, right? Right now for big ticket items, you are going to have to provide extended trial. Give them more time, give them more flexible payment, flexible due dates. Those are all the things that will encourage people to want to consider buying now because they are under pressure. They may not have disposable income of the sort to be able to afford it right away if they're not back on the job, right? So if it, you give them three months, six months, whatever it is that you can afford from a financial consideration point of view, it will incite people to want to do that, right? Now, your marketing, as I said, is going to have to be full funnel. And Digital Programmatic is amazingly well equipped to help you optimize across Awareness building, education, reminders, and conversions. All of this can happen quite flexibly, which I'm going to come to in a second. And the reason you need to do all of this stuff is look at this, right? This is one of those providers of mattresses that were brands that we actually work with. You need to be able to optimize the journey. You can start with bigger, you know, more solid storytelling, creative, but progressively you can build it down to the point where you can do the reminders in a way that you are able to manage the journey and be able to get the efficiency you are looking for. At this point, you need to extract 
every little bit of juice out of this thing of the investment that you do that you can. Your budgets are going to be tight and you need as much efficiency as you can pull out of it. And doing it programmatically is potentially the best way you can extract. Okay, now I'm shifting the base to where the demand slide is happening. What should these brands be doing? But most of these communications have to be upper funnel and has to be customer communications in parallel. Why? Because you need to retain your high value customers with content to ensure their loyalty. I'm gonna show you some great examples of some of the communications I've personally received. Uh, you want to sustain brand awareness for long cycle purchases. You know, it takes six months to eight months before somebody can decide and make a decision on buying a big vehicle for fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. That's a lot of money. You're going to think about it, right? And so that doesn't mean you should discontinue advertising um, and show some sensitivity and commitment to the community in crisis. Um, look at some examples. Here's Delta. Wanting to continue the communication, they recognize that I have a status with Delta. They remind me how many miles I have and how much loyalty I've shown over time. They're being very sincere, very transparent. They tell you, they gave me a very detailed report directly from the CEO, which says exactly how they are planning to keep their aircrafts clean and hygienic, how they are planning to maintain their schedule over the next few months. I mean, it was just amazingly detailed very, very honest, very genuine communication. You feel like doing business with this brand, even though I'm not flying these days. Eventually, when I'm on the road, I will absolutely think about Delta when they treat me like this, right? Look at Marriott Bonvoy, the, you know, waiving cancellation fees, you know, Cosmo, which is actually extending memberships and the rewards and the usage of it for extra nights. This is all part of keeping the relationship constant so you don't forget the people who've been with you, right? These are your important customers. If they abandon you, where are you going to be at the other end when we are out of this whole mess, right? And so here's Ford. This is the attitude. You see what Ford is doing. Look at what Ford is telling you. We've been through wars. We've been through disasters. You know, we've helped you build this country, right? We've been there with you and we are going to be there this time as well. You know, this is a company that sells the F-150, one of the most popular vehicle, the truck, which many small businesses buy and use. They need this kind of encouragement and support right now. This is Ford. Okay, let me wrap this up with some few parting comments. First of all, let's talk about what it is that you can do regarding media the top five actions. You see the frequent questions we get now is how can I get budget flexibility and really thorough optimization? Well, you can't get that anywhere but through your programmatic digital media. That gives you the most control. You wanna stop it tomorrow because something crazy happens in your business, you can do that. You want to ramp it up and you want to scale to some crazy numbers and spending millions of dollars every week, you can do that. You have that control. You want the share of attention? Yes, you can get that through digital streaming media. That's where the consumer attention is right now. You want scaled reach and conversion, right? Okay, manage frequency across screens, manage that. That's the way you're gonna get the efficiency. Many, many clients are actually asking questions about should we be blocking all this COVID related news material and stay out of it? My recommendation is no, why? You are in that reality these days. Solve the problem. Come up with a creative that is sensitive to the context. That is where people are. That is where everybody is. They want to know what's going on and that's the news right now. And so avoiding it isn't going to solve any problems for you. It will just make it harder for you to get the conversions you're looking for. You want the return on ad spend? Follow the journey carefully. Understand the consumer value across the journey. Remain true to the essentials of efficiency. That's where you get that. And now is the time for you to build the consumer direct relationships. Not just for selling stuff, 
It's because you want to get to know the consumers really well so you can drive your future marketing that's very informed. Stuff you didn't have the benefit of in the past. You look at the DTC brands. They are amazingly powerhouses now because they have so much information about the consumers and they are tailoring all of that in this period. They're perfectly set up for this. I have some parting statements for you in terms of crisis sensitivity. One, you do not have the option to remain silent. You have to say something. Silence isn't an indication or an expression of sensitivity. So figure out what are you going to say. Second is, say something that you genuinely believe in. This is the time to build trust. You're going to show empathy. Who are you going to show the empathy to? It's employees, it's customers, and it's the community. These are the people who have been loyal to you all these years. Now is their turn. You need to show it to them. Inspire them. We are all down. We need to be inspired. We need hope. We need to see a promising future, right? And above all, be human. It's okay. You don't have to know everything. But say that and say that in a way that you truly care. That's what we have for today. We are open for questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Suraj. So we have a few questions in here from um, some of the attendees. So one of the first questions we have here is when you say that search is going to be steady, is that search for each individual brand or SEM overall? If it's search in general, wouldn't you think that would increase? So search volumes are going to increase for sure, right? All I'm saying is that are people going to want to spend all significantly more money in search advertising? That is the question. Um, and I think there, it is not necessarily going to be disproportionately search relative to others. That is our prediction at this point. And not all advertising, as we have already talked about, needs to be at the low end of the funnel. Great. Uh, so I'll just go down the list here as well. Uh, we've got what about brands that are retail focused and do not have a strong online component? Well, <clears throat> It's a, that's a tough place to be um, because as I have said, I've already made the case, you need to figure out a way to get people uh, to connect with you online one way or the other. That's really where people are spending the time. How else are you gonna get them and bring them there? I mean, seriously, uh, it is just progressively getting harder and harder to make it into retail establishments. For the next three to four weeks, I, I just don't know what is an alternative. Um, almost every retail establishment is limiting even entry. Even if you make it there, there are very long lines outside because they can only allow so many people inside a store to maintain distance. And so to avoid all the crowding, uh, it is, it, 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 the incentives are simply not there. They're amazing disincentives. I mean, I was, I was just there at, 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 the, at Whole Foods just yesterday, and there was a line which went about a mile, uh, you know, to enter. It took me 45 minutes before I could get into the store. Who wants to do that? And so right now, it's a, it's a difficult place. You just need to have alternatives available uh, through the virtual environment for people to want to engage with you and figure out an, an alternative. Great. So we've got um, a question from Shruti here. Hi, Shruti. Thanks for tuning in. Um, she's asking, how do we bring folks along internally in this uncertain environment? Yes, yes, that's a, that's a very relevant question at this point. Um, the, 
the way the way to think about it is i think you know which is what we were trying to do here in this session right you you want to bring everybody on the same page first of all you know people are operating off of very different data sets and therefore different assumptions you want to bring them all and show them what it is that you are seeing and see if we can bring some level of sensitivity to how we can all understand what the context is right now right it's evolving of course very fast um, but you can still be reasonably well grounded about what we know so far and then make your decisions accordingly i think um, regardless of where in the spectrum of advertising and marketing you are in everybody needs to understand of the factors that we have just identified right whether you have serious demand outstripping supply or the other way you need to be able to proactively manage to that and understand your planning horizon over which all of this is going to play out and so uh, if you have sufficient demand obviously you need to be very careful not to go crazy uh, simply you're putting more pressure on the supply which is useless uh, you disappoint a lot of consumers on the other hand you want to keep your brand top of mind you can't disappear as i said right and so having the presence is critical to really keeping the brand in the consideration space otherwise two issues will happen for you number one the channel will eventually abandon you if you don't maintain the awareness levels and second the consumers in the community will wonder it's like what happened to you where are you and so uh, those are all the ways you know you need to be able to protect yourself and be consistent with who you are and what you believe in okay we've got um what advice do you have for a restaurant brand who is trying to balance an overarching feel-good message with daily to-go and delivery promotions? Yeah, I mean, that's really the only alternative left for the restaurant business at this point, right? Which is to encourage. The issue here is there are two types of restaurants. There is one which is actually designed for the fast cycle, easily consumable menu from which you can order and get things delivered, right? And then there are the, uh, the restaurants whose menu isn't necessarily conducive to that kind of fast package delivery consumption, right? I think depending on what side you are, you have to rethink your product and your menu in terms of what you are willing to accommodate that makes your whole delivery service conducive to people who are loyal to your brand, who have been frequent visitors to your restaurant, who will actually consider because they will eventually miss out on not being able to come and experience what you had to provide. And so you want to be thinking creatively about how you can serve that pent up demand. I mean, you know, people can not go to the restaurant maybe for a week or two weeks, but eventually they are gonna miss it, right? If they have been frequenters. And therefore, they will want to uh, want to find a way to get it, and you want to be available for that. And I think that's the minimum you can do is keep your current customer base uh, satisfied and remain loyal. I mean, that's really the storyline here in terms of how I see establishments that cannot really accommodate the regular service must continue that communication one way or the other. Uh, pull an agency specific one. We've got a question. How do you get your clients to think in terms of that six to nine month planning timeline when they are telling you their company is making marketing decisions monthly or even weekly? Yes, that is true. Uh, just because you are making decisions on allocations of one sort or the other or the creative messages weekly and monthly or whatever daily um, doesn't mean you can't plan and have some idea and the knowledge of what horizon you need to be thinking about right the, it, no company operates on a daily or a weekly thing right 
it makes no sense to me. If you are a business and a franchise and a consumer base or a customer base out there, you need to have continuity and some knowledge of what they are going through and what that whole cycle is going to be like. The world isn't coming to an end. Not all of us are going to die tomorrow. And so the, the point here is you need to see where the evolution of the consumer psyche is headed. And if you are the agency, that is your job to manage the client to behave in a more logical way without having their hair on fire all the time. I, I, I'm, I'm not complaining that you aren't doing that. All I'm saying is that's what we do every single day is like bring some logic, some fact base, some thinking, some creativity so that they understand that you are ahead of the game, that the client doesn't have to feel the burden of this issue all the time themselves. That's why they have you as the agency partner. Remember, I have the license to speak like this. I managed a business, a large agency like Digitas for 14 years. I know what it is like. That's the craziness that the client will drive you crazy. If you aren't ahead of the game, if you aren't coming with your ideas and proactive and building their conviction, as opposed to thinking the client is going crazy, that is not the case. You need to be ahead of the game and let them know, here are the three things I anticipate. Based on that, here are the ideas. This is what you, we think you should be doing now versus next month versus three months from now. And I think that's the kind of planning that's required. It's hard work for you. I, I, I'm, I'm not undermining that. It's a real challenge, but it does require you to really work on overload here at this point. There's just no other way to prevent that. Otherwise, you, you will feel the whiplash all over the place. Okay, so we, uh, we've got about seven minutes of everyone's time. Did you want to do one more question? I just want to mention that um, there's quite a few questions. We will ensure to get you an answer to your question, whether we answer it here live in the session or as a follow-up. Um, Suraj, did you want to close out or do you want to take one more? We can take one more. It's all right. Okay. So I've got, how do smaller brands play in the sandbox when large brands in their category are exponentially outspending them and ramping up ad spend during this uncertain time? Ah, that's, that's an interesting uh, question uh, because um, ad spending um, is one part of the equation here. And depending on the category you're talking about, certainly, right? I mean, we, it, it's extremely important. Like, who are you fighting with? Almost every category has leaders and it has challengers. And while leaders have traditional advantage of all the money they've invested over the years in building up brand equity, Challengers have the advantage of coming into the play with something unusual, something slightly different, a proposition that comes from the flank. And I think you need to think about what that new refreshed messaging is going to be that's going to provide you the differentiation. Okay, It's not all about spending money in media, right? Those guys can, but you can be different. That's the key. How can you be different? And the different comes in many, many different ways. You see, when I talked about this brand, Urinozinc, you see what they're doing, that's very different. The big brands are not doing that. They don't really care. They're just dumping media dollars all over the place. But for a consumer who's differentiating, who understands that the brand is trying to help me, I am willing to consider. I will change my mind because I see something different. And so that's what you need to think about, you know? There are plenty of big brands out there really doing psychiatry of one sort or the other. There are at least 72 different drugs that are dealing with one or the other type of mental health issues. And yet, we have a small brand in Genomind who just introduced telepsychiatry. Imagine that. 
if you are a challenger brand, behave like a challenger brand. Do something different and challenge the leaders. That's the way you're gonna build something significant for yourself. It's not all about spending media money. Great, so one, one final thing. Um, someone would like to know what your favorite book is from the bookcase behind you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I tell you, the last book I read, which comes to mind, which is so appropriate for today's discussion, it's The Infinite Game. The uh, Infinite Game uh, by, I even forget the author. This guy is very popular out there. Um, he, uh, what's his name? I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you look it up on Amazon or any other bookstore that's your favorite and you will see. So the, the, the reason I liked that book and the message so much, I even gave it to several of my clients. Simon uh, Sinek. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, uh, Simon. And uh, the reason I like it is he sees like the fundamental premise of that book is that the winning in a corporate and a business environment is not about making the next quarterly target. It's not a sports game where there are winners and losers. It's not like a game of football or a game of ice hockey that will last for a couple hours and somebody will win and somebody's going to lose. In the business game, there is no winning and losing. We are supposed to create a sustainable business over time, serving the consumer and the customer base over time, progressively with better values and better benefits. Whether through the good times or the bad times, we are supposed to take care of our employees through good times or the bad times. This is a, a, an, a long game. This is not how can we make the numbers next month, next week. It's just a beautiful paradigm to really think about if you really want a perspective, like literally right now. This is the time when it feels like everything is down and nothing seems to be working the way we thought it was working and so forth. You need to understand we are in a long game. 